I think that there are, in general, uh, two types of questions you can ask about the world. And one is, what is it like? You know, how is the world? What, what, what is the reality out there? And the second question are how to questions, that how can you change the world? It's very important that uh, when, when the world tells us something that we thought we knew but didn't, that we recognize it and that we correct. Call whatever you want the society we live in, I would leave that to the historians. I think we should all be focused on how to make it better. I think that the world is going to become more globalized. And I don't see an easy way for governments to prohibit that. We are full of challenges that we know of and a bunch of challenges that we are probably not even aware of. And that dealing with those challenges will force change. And, and that change will eventually make us look uh, different from the way we currently look now. I think economics um, is, if you want, a science uh, that I think should be defined by the questions that it asks. And I think it asks important questions about, uh, you know, how to generate prosperity in a society, how to generate stability in a society, how to generate inclusion in a society, um, how to generate sustainability in a society, and so on. So, so I think. Um, uh, um, um, the, the, the questions that, uh, that motivate it are, are important questions for, for societies. Um, uh, sometimes uh, some economists like to define economics by the methods that it uses, but uh, my impression is that that's, that's the wrong definition because uh, the methods evolve as we learn more how to do science, as we, as we can think through um, uh, new, uh, new approaches, new methodologies. So I think that, that the questions are, are durable, the methods are, are, are less important or, or less defining. I think this is a great question and it's a fundamental question. Um, um, I think that there are, in general, uh, two types of questions you can ask about the world. And one is, what is it like? You know, how is the world? What, what, what is the reality out there? And the second question are how to questions, that how can you change the world? So the first question say, it's like physics or chemistry. Right. Uh, what, what is what is the nature of, of reality out there and what are the, the regularities or the laws that reality seem to, to follow or not? How, how to think systematically about that reality? And the second one is, is how do you change the world? How, how to question? So those are questions in engineering, if you want. Uh, now, in, in a university, there's a physics department and there's an engineering department. And uh, there are physicists that teach in the engineering department, but engineering is not physics. It, it asks different questions. It, it, it mobilizes different uh, sets of knowledge to answer those questions. So maybe if you want to make a tool uh, that uses electricity, that's fine, but you may also need to know about plastics or about ceramics or about glass or about metals or about other things because you're making a tool and you're going to have to know everything that the tool requires. So I think of myself, I'm a professor at the Harvard Kennedy School, which is a uh, public policy school. So I would like to think that I'm in the engineering department, but I'm at a university, I'm an academic, I'm supposed to be publishing stuff and so on. So I think of myself as an engineer uh, that also likes to dabble into physics, but, um, but, uh, but that those two disciplines, at least in our head, should be clearly distinct. That the how-to questions um, involve you know, integrating a lot of uh, knowledge uh, that is not as, uh, as, uh, uh, as, as uh, you know, um, 
separable as when you ask a, 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 an analytic question about the nature of the world. So uh, when you think about the world, you can say, oh, let me abstract uh, from, from the wind and the friction of the air and let me assume, you know, how would things would work in a vacuum and so on. Um, when you do engineering, you cannot assume that there's a vacuum and there's no friction of the air. You have to design for things as, as they are. As I like to say, say, there's no such thing as a perfect suit. There's only such things as a perfectly tailored suit. And engineering questions involve a lot of tailoring. It does not involve a lot of general principles that they are universal. Okay, so, so there are at least two, two parts of that question. I think um, um, <clears throat> there are, what is, the, what is the proper relationship between say the sciences or the engineering and, and society? And the second question is what constitutes the common good? And I think that uh, one of the things that uh, in a democratic society must be clear is that the common good is not something that pre-exists, it's something that emerges. It's, a, it's, it's something that should be the outcome of some participatory political process where everybody can voice their, their preferences and say, you know, do you want more of A or more of B? What's the right trade-off? Uh, should we open up the schools because because uh, education is important for the kids or should we keep them closed because the pandemic is a problem? What's the right trade-off between those two risks, et cetera, et cetera. So, so those preferences and, and, and those views have to emerge from, from some participatory political process uh, that, I think, uh, that I think it's important. The moment you think that the common good can be uh, defined ex ante without participation, uh, then you say, let's make ourselves into a dictatorship, let's give all the power to economists and let's make them all, all the decisions, right? So, so uh, what I think that economics should do is it should participate in that process, maybe on opposite sides of that process by people trying to make their best case, their best argument uh, for whatever vision they have. And that, um, you know, uh, the judicial system in the Anglo-Saxon uh, tradition was based on the idea that you have a prosecution, you have a defense, you have a judge that, that, that uh, makes sure that the process is fine, and then you have a jury that is the final decision maker. So I think I can see economics in the prosecution and economics in the defense uh, and let the process, you know, in reveal more information. In that sense, I'm a little bit more Popperian, if you want, in the sense that uh, an open society uh, is the way to get to objective truths or to 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 uncover, uh, you know, things that are more 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 appropriate. I think that if you define economics as, as a set of questions and so on, I think that the questions you just mentioned are super important. And to the extent that economists can, can make progress in them, it will, it's great. So for example, I think that economics has made very significant contributions to the study of global warming and climate change and so on. And what's the nature of the externalities and how to, how to deal with them. And should we put a carbon tax or, or cap and trade or, or you know, all these other, other um, mechanism design as they would call it in economics to, to figure out how to, how to deal with climate change, how to, how to encourage a certain uh, technological uh, innovation process that would uh, deal with, um, with climate change. All of those are, are, are legitimate uh, questions in economics. And I think that economics has made a significant um, progress in them. In other dimensions, for example, a race, identity, so on, these are uh, issues that, um, you know, George Akerlof, uh, working with Rachel uh, Cranton, has made, um, you know, has made really seminal work. Uh, you know, the economics of identity is, uh, is a field that I think should deserve much more attention. Uh, the economics of 
of discrimination, etc. All of these things are valid questions. And, and to the extent that they are important social issues, I think that uh, they should remain part of, um, part of uh, uh, you know, legitimate questions in economics. So I, I think there's a, a sense of, I mean, I don't, I don't think economics should be held accountable in the same way as you wouldn't say that engineering should be held accountable for the challenger disaster. Uh, that, that is that there's a, uh, so, so accountability sh to some extent is an individual thing. So uh, one of the problems of, of uh, accountability also is that uh, is, is the problem of attribution. You know, nothing that happens in society can be easily attributed to one original cause, right? Because it's, it, it, it's, um, it's the outcome of many moving pieces. Uh, and it, it's hard to, very often hard to attribute responsibility to one particular action or one particular thing that somebody said at a meeting or an advice that somebody, so, somebody um, uh, said because you know in their defense they can always say yes but I, I, I mentioned that in the context of the 10 other things that didn't happen or whatever right so I think that the attribution is, 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 an, is a problem on the bad side when things go wrong or on the good side everybody wants to take credit for for things that might have happened without their without their participation anyway so um, I think that um, what's more important I think is that we learn and that we that that uh, to the extent that we make uh, mistakes, that um, that we think about issues uh, with some ideas in mind, and then uh, reality ended up being different, uh, that we have the capacity to learn and correct. So, for example, right now there's a big debate in the U.S. between people who are very friendly to each other, uh, say um, between Larry Summers on the one hand and maybe Paul Krugman or, or others or uh, Janet Yellen on the other uh, about, you know, how much is too much? That is, what is the productive capacity of the economy? Well, economists used to think that uh, if unemployment went below 5% or 4%, you would get uh, inflation accelerating and the economy overheating and putting, you know, the possibility of a need for a recession to cut the process off, then we have seen, you know, unemployment go to three and a half, three percent, and so on, and and nothing happened to inflation or whatever. And so, so right now, we just we know that in some sense we know that we don't know. We thought we knew. It's very important that uh, when when the world tells us something that we thought we knew but didn't that we recognize it and that we correct. And, and that, that in my mind is, is, is the most useful thing that, that, um, that we are able to, uh, to learn from, from uh, our own priors. I mean, in some sense, uh, you know, I'm very Bayesian in the sense that you have some priors and then something happens and then you update your priors. How, how good is our process of updating? I, I would give it to you that there are some economists that are so, uh, uh, believe so much their their assumptions that they cannot imagine that their assumptions might uh, might not be warranted and, and and but cannot think outside of them and and I think that that's a defect in thinking but uh, uh, so that's why I think it's it's very important that we leave uh, that we leave enough room for for us to update our assumptions about the world uh, by through the experience that we have in acting on the world. There's a famous uh, a quote by uh, Paul Krugman who once said, those that can do, those that can't discuss methodology. Um, so, um, you know, we, we should, um, it, uh, you know, we have the world as, as we have it. Um, you want to give it a name of capitalism, uh, you know, that, that's fine. But if we find it wanting and if we can imagine ways of making it better, uh, let, let's work on that. And, and then maybe 
in the future, some historian is going to say this was the birth of X or the birth of Y or, or you know, uh, they will hyphenate that capitalism into something new, but you were just solving problems. So I think that most people would agree that the healthcare system in Canada works better than the healthcare system in the US, at least in generating more satisfaction in the public and, and more coverage and better health outcomes at a lower price, uh, right? Now, uh, that would require a set of reforms in the US, which would maybe still be called capitalism or whatever, but, but it would be not the same as before. It, it would be a, a, a change and, and then historians will maybe you know, label that as a watershed event or not. I think that capitalism in Marx's mind, okay, in, in, what he was thinking is that there was a bunch of, the production was happening in these small units of family businesses, right? The, the shopkeepers and, and, and artisans and stuff that in his language, they own their means of production. They own the tools with which they would do their stuff, right? The, ba ba the, the, the butcher, the baker, and the candlestick maker. And what impressed him was the idea that there was this transformation in production where production units would become much bigger, more people working there, and uh, with machines and stuff, and somebody would own these businesses and these machines and so on, that they would own the means of production and the others would just, in his language, sell their labor to, uh, to the owners of the means of production. And that was in his mind, capitalism. So if you take Marx's definition, then uh, to a large extent, um, uh, capitalism has been a surprising failure in much of the world because while in the US, something like 90% of people are, say, wage laborers, they work for an employer that pays them a wage, which is what Marx had in mind that uh, what was going to happen. So it did happen in the US. You know, a, one out of three people in, in, in the state of where Monterrey is in Mexico uh, don't have a wage. They work uh, as self-employed or in many enterprises like the ones that existed when Marx was writing and he thought that they would disappear. Well, that's one third of, a, of, of the labor force. It's um, six sevenths of the labor force in Chiapas, Mexico. Uh, and it's you know, a 19 20th of the labor force in India. So, so in a lot of the world, that transformation didn't happen. And I think it didn't happen and is, that means uh, the world remained more like people who are self-employed, the artisans working independently and so on. And that is associated with low productivity, low incomes, high poverty and so on. Why? Because what we have discovered, what I, at least my take on, 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 on what, what the uh, societal challenge is, is, is that in a large firm, you have what Adam Smith would have called the division of labor. I would call the division of knowledge. That is in a large firm, you have people who know about more different things. You know, people who know about procurement, about production, about marketing, about branding, about finance, about accounting, about taxes, about contracts, about human resource management, et cetera, et cetera. And so the whole knows more than any individual could possibly know because you've put different bits of knowledge in different heads. And by bringing all of these heads together, a social brain develops that can do more than any individual could. And, and that has taken the form of this, what you might want to call capitalist enterprises. But we've also figured that, you know, a modern society has many other forms of organization. To my knowledge, I don't know of any top ranked in for-profit universities. They don't exist in my mind. You know, there are no such thing as, you know, top quality for-profit universities. There's, um, there's a huge sector of NGOs and stuff that does a lot of things that cannot be organized for profit. And these things have emerged. There's a huge participation of, of um, 
of governments in many, many things, you know, there, there is a market for cars and you can decide, you know, whether you want a Toyota or a Ford or what you want. And these are all private companies and so on. There is no market for highways. And without highways, the car is not very useful. So there's an enormous complementarity on things that are organized collectively and things that are organized through markets. So uh, I think that, that that's the society we live in and, and that part of the problem, I mean, part of the ideology of thinking that, um, uh, that a society could potentially have been organized only through markets and that, uh, that if left on their own, they would do great things and so on, we would all be with cars and no roads. So, um, so that would not be a world where we would want to live in and it's not the world we have inherited. So I think that, um, you know, call whatever you want the society we live in, I would leave that to the historians. I think we should all be focused on how to make it better. probably at an interesting crossroads. There are two radically different uh, trends out there. Um, one trend uh, is the fact that we were in a unipolar world where the US was preeminent after the collapse of the Soviet Union. Uh, we're not in that world anymore. That uh, um, there is more distributive power in the world um, and, and if we, you know, if, if if the world moves in the direction that most people would like to see it move, that is, where uh, poor countries tend to uh, catch up, and so that they they develop uh, living standards that are closer to where rich countries are today. Well, uh, in that case, those gaps between you know the poor and the rich countries would be smaller, and and consequently those gaps in power would also be smaller. And the US, which represents something like 5% of the world population, is not going to be the dominant player. So how do you live in a world where there are more people who feel empowered, autonomous, and so on? Well, what's that equilibrium, right? And, and um, so that's, a, that's one, one, uh, one source of pressure. I, I like to say that people complain a lot about inequality, but um, a lot of the pressures on the world are the consequences of increasing equality. That is, the fact that the poor countries are catching up means that there's more competition in many industries that were you know, comfortably stable in rich countries and, and so on. A, a, second, a second dimension is a, that there's been um, a, ten, ten, a tension between having a sovereign policies and having common policies. That there is a benefit of having sovereign policies because then democracy can decide what you want, etc. But in a world that is interconnected, having a sovereign policy is like, you know, having the right to build half a bridge. You know, if your bridge connects with your neighbor and if he does not decide to make the bridge or she doesn't decide to make the bridge, you get half a bridge. And on half a bridge, you don't get half the traffic, you get zero. So, so there is a benefit of having common policies. And that's why you've seen so much pressure in the European Union, say, to want to become a bigger thing where, you know, um, yes, we are going to abandon some of our sovereign policies, but in exchange for that, we're going to have the benefit of having policies that are, that are more common. And, and so, so, so I think that's a second tension that's out there. Um, uh, and, um, uh, and some people think, uh, my colleague Dan, Danny Roderick thinks that, um, that the, the idea of common policies has gone too far, that we need to, uh, to re-empower, uh, that the balance between common policies and sovereign policies has moved uh, too far in one, in one direction. And so my, my, um, my, my sense is that it, it, the world is in flux. Um, the current equilibrium is not uh, likely to last. It's generating a lot of uh, political tensions. But I hope, and, and there's, there's one more thing. 
you know, there's a lot of talk about trade and, and you know, protection or whatever. But uh, one of the things that, um, that is happening right now is that uh, Julian is in Canada. Fabio, you are in Berlin, you're Italian. And I'm here in the US and Venezuela. And we're producing something, some, some output that is done in common, right? And, and we, we cannot imagine what is a world that would prohibit us from doing this, right? right. And one of the things that happened with uh, COVID is that we learned that we could do a lot of things from home. But anything that can be done hom from home can be done from abroad. So at least in terms of all of these things that are teleworkable, I think that the world is going to become more globalized. And I don't see an easy way for governments to prohibit that. And in any case, I don't see why they would. And I don't, I don't want to imagine what are the infringements on our individual liberties uh, that would uh, allow them to prohibit us from doing what we're doing right now. So in some sense, I think that the arrow of uh, globalization is with us, uh, that, that uh, you know, there will be uh, uh, questions of how do you organize political systems given this uh, integration uh, of knowledge and, and information that, uh, that characterizes the world. But I look at, at our current program and I look at the future with excitement. I don't, I don't, I don't find that as a, you know, as a dark, dangerous future. I hope we are able to manage the consequences in a way that uh, that makes that that future uh, more promising. Uh, if, if I could just come in for a sec, we, you, so the there's a setback for physical globalization in, in some form, but digital globalization obviously is accelerated. So that you're you're talking about uh, like the digital globalization, yeah. Yeah, very interesting. expanding scope of digital globalization because it involves, uh, you know, the globalization of tasks. It will re-engineer global value chains because many of the things that uh, that can be done from home will be done from anywhere in in the planet, and and that's going to, you know, you have now these these digital nomads that uh, realize that they can work from anywhere. So why not from a national park, uh, and and so on. So so I think. Uh, you know, these are trends uh, that our institutions were not designed with those possibilities in mind, and they're bound to generate, um, you know, issues. I think there was this uh, Spanish philosopher called uh, Ortega y Gasset. Uh, who said, uh, I am I and my circumstances. That is, I am not I, so, so we live with a set of circumstances and I, we cannot walk away from those circumstances. I think that um, um, uh, we, will, we are full of challenges that we know of and a bunch of challenges that we are probably not even aware of and that dealing with those challenges will force change. And, and that change, will eventually make us look uh, different from the way we currently look now. That, that those changes may not have been designed, they might have emerged, they will accumulate to something that will look different. That, so I think that right now um, uh, we understand uh, that uh, 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 I'll, I'll, you know, the, in the old language of, say, Hayek, um, a capitalism, if you want, was about freedom. And property rights was a way of guaranteeing individual freedom. And, uh, and, and, and freedom was sort of like a, a unifying concept. Uh, I think that modern technology, by by requiring uh, many different people who know about different things, collaborating, you know, puts a greater accent on collaboration. And so, for example, while you know, famously Milton Friedman uh, said that you know, the social responsibility of the firm is to its shareholders, 
that now has come into question by everybody that you know, now they want to say it's the stakeholders. Why? Because you rely on your suppliers, because you rely on your workers, because you rely on your neighbors who want to make sure that you know, they're not going to die because you polluted their environment, uh, that you want to rely on your customers and their trust and so on, that you want to rely on, on, your, on your creditors and your investors. That, so, so there's a whole ecosystem of people uh, that you rely on, that their trust and, and support you, you seek and require. And so, so I think that um, uh, the, whatever capitalism that, uh, uh, that you want emerges, it's one that um, is able to secure a more stable, um, and more productive forms of collaboration. Uh, and you know, collaboration is you know, among free people, but about among free people that collaborate. <laughs>